Welcome to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. A couple of months ago, we had on Matt Burke, center for the uh, Minnesota Vikings and Baltimore Ravens, who played Ivy League football, played for Harvard. And we had Don Maynard on, who was part of the 69 Jets. Today, we're combining the two of them because we got somebody who played Ivy League football and played for the Jets in the, on the Super Bowl team, John Dockery. Welcome to Connors Corner, John. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here. Go back 19... 19- well, 1968 season, 1969, where were you on the team and what was the atmosphere like? I was struggling after a, uh, a baseball career that didn't happen. And uh, I had a tryout over at Randall's Island. And uh, you know, it was actually George Paterno, who was my high school football coach at Brooklyn Prep, who knew we Bank and said, hey, you ought to take a look at this guy. He can run, he can play. And uh, he did. And I uh, made an attempt at covering Maynard and Sauer uh, and Randall's Island and uh, came out okay and was activated soon thereafter and uh, after being on the taxi squad and played in the Super Bowl special teams mostly. You just mentioned you tried to cover Maynard and Sauer. Who was, who were those guys? <laughs> who were those guys? Yeah. Don Maynard and George Sauer were two of the best receivers in the game and uh, different, totally different, which made them even more effective. You know, you know the Maynard was that long, striding Texan who had super speed, but it looked like he was uh, relatively slow. But he was, and George Tower had terrific moves and balance, and uh, was just about impossible to cover in that you know zone between eight and twenty-five yards. He just, and he caught everything in sight. He was about six-two. Good frame, strong, and uh, a terrific player. That Raiders game was a great game. Oh yeah. Did you, in your heart, believe that you guys as a team would, would win the Super Bowl? No, I don't believe. Mike, were you around then? I mean, come oh, on. Oh, yes, I was, yes. <laughs> okay, I just want to make make sure. Um, did we think we were going to win the Super Bowl? We're 18-point underdogs. Everybody right. else believed we would not and had no shot. Of course, Joe Willie Namath was uh, shooting off his mouth before the game, guaranteeing things, and that made us all sweat a little more. But in another way, you know, when you're a leader – and your quarterback uh, in a game that's just quarterback-driven guarantees a win, you have to st- step back and think, well, maybe we have a shot. But, Mike, if you look at that team, and had they, there were some players on it, real good players that no one seemed to give them credit for. Snell and Boozer, um, Sauer and Maynard, as you mentioned, and uh, Winston Hill at the, at the weak side tackle, and... Uh, some really good players across the board. Yes, we got we played well, and Joe played well, but Matt Snell might have been the MVP of the game. He had a hundred and some odd yards, I believe. Oh no, he had a great game, and I don't think anybody could rem- nobody could forget who saw that game. His touchdown run at the beginning. Yes, exactly. So we got a little lift, and off we went. And um, I don't know if we believe for sure, but there was an inkling that we could take these guys. And, you know, they didn't know us that well, and we didn't know them that well because it was, you know, the leagues were coming together, the AFL and the NFL. And, uh, you know, so we had, you know, we were an unknown commodity, which was probably a good idea to sneak up on them. Well, let me ask you something. You talk about Weeb Eubank. Tell the audience a little bit about Weeb Eubank because he's sort of forgotten right now. You know, he won two championships as an NFL coach. Isn't it amazing? And all they, all they talk about is Pittsburgh in the 70s, the dynasty, and now, of course, Brady and Belichick are now. Um, Weeb was a laid-back kind of guy. He'd be wandering around like he was lost. But all the time, his mind was working, and he was a good you know, strategy, strategy man and uh, was pretty good at picking players, too. Um, of course, he and Joe didn't know what was to agree on things because they were totally different personalities. At one time, I'll just give you a little anecdote. You may have heard it. So it's it's before the, uh, you know, before the Super Bowl, and you know, the Raiders game was in there, and and Joe is having a horrendous practice, terrible. He's throwing most balls into the ground, and he's just so fed up and frustrated. He finally takes the ball and just wings it, you know, into the stands, and says, "That's it. I'm leaving." Weave Eubank is standing about ten yards away and said, "All right, everybody off the field." <laughs> so, who was coaching the team? Is my question. <laughs> <laughs> Now, am I mistaken, but, but Weeb Eubank would bring guys in and out a little bit more than most of the coaches did back then. In and out in terms of uh, in a game? Or yes, in, in, like third yeah. down or things like that. Yeah, he would do that. And, uh, and uh, you know, 
did we have the greatest team on earth? No, but we had a better team than anyone you gave us credit for. And, uh, um, you know, he'd bring people in and out to try and get a different look. Um, and he was, he, he was smart, quiet, but smart. And, uh, and it worked well for him. And team had confidence in him, um, even though he wasn't like a, a Chuck Noel where you looked at him the wrong way. I played for a couple of years in Pittsburgh. And uh, Chuck Noel, if you looked at him the wrong way, you'd be gone. You'd be on waivers. Go find someplace else to play. He was one tough nut, just the opposite of Wee Bubank, who was kind of cruising along. <laughs> and doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned the fact your, your your first dream was to play professional baseball. What happened there? How, you got signed by the Red Sox? I got signed by the Red Sox when I got out of school, and uh, I actually did finish college, believe it or not, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, the Red Sox, you know, we obviously the Red Sox and the Ivy League had some connection, and, and especially at Harvard, and uh, so they – I went over to Fenway Park to give it a shot, try out, hit some balls, catch some things. The thing I could do, you know, fairly well is run. And uh, and they liked that. I mean, in terms of hitting and uh, fielding, I was all right, too. I played the outfield and could go and get things. But in terms of the thing you have to do in, in pro baseball is is hit, and uh, and that wasn't something I could do. I was, you know, 220, 240 hitter. And uh, so I went from... Um, I went from Pittsfield, which was double-A, uh, slid down the pipe to Winston-Salem, and eventually to Waterloo, Iowa, and to eventually into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was a steady slide, but it was an adventure. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't enjoy getting cut and all from the places, but it was something different, and I always wanted to do it. Who were some of the guys you played with in the minor leagues? I'll tell you what, the uh, some of the big Big bats for the Red Sox. Um, you know, Canigliaro was there. Um, who else? Um, the thing I remember most about the Red Sox, yeah, we played some with some really good players, George Scott. Um, but the thing I remember most is in, in the batting cage trying to figure out how to hit the ball, which was a, which was a major challenge. And who comes in to teach you? Ted Williams. It's like <laughs> God coming on earth and saying, okay, here's what you do. <laughs> Ted Williams. <laughs> so it was, you know, those are the kinds of memories that come along with you turn out to be as successful or not. So, um, What did you think of Ted Williams as a hitting instructor? Because I've heard different opinions. Yeah, yeah, and you should hear different opinions. I mean, I was awestruck by him. Ted Williams, geez, my. You know, I mean, I was grew up in the Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, you know, Ted Williams era. Um and he was just such a, one of the greatest hitters of all time. And uh, But in terms of communicating and seeming to care about what he was doing, uh, left a little bit to be desired. He wasn't the warmest uh, fuzzy guy uh, around. He was kind of a, a distant guy and says, here it is. This is what you should do. And if you do do it and can do it, you'll, you can get, you'll hit. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> of course, I, could, I couldn't do it. <laughs> We'll send you out there next time, Mike. Yeah, all right. All <laughs> right. St. So, Francis days. <laughs> yeah. So let, let me ask you this. Okay. How do you get into football then? What's what's the transition? So I'm wandering around, figuring what I'm going to do with my life, and you know, disappointed, definitely. And uh, you know, I applied to graduate school and went to Columbia School of Architecture, and that's where I was going when George Paterno um, called Wee Bubank and said, you know, take a look at this guy. And he did, and I went over to Randall's Island, as I mentioned, and uh, and was given a spot. You know, thought they saw something that might be useful, and uh, put me on the taxi squad. And uh, that was in '67, '68, '68. I'm on the team uh, at the end of the year and in the Super Bowl, <laughs> from places like Waterloo, Iowa, <laughs> to the Super Bowl <laughs> in Florida, in Miami. So you got more playing time a little bit further on. So how many years did you play for the Jets? I played five years. Okay. And what what was your most memorable moment as a member of the New York Jets besides playing in the Super Bowl or being in the Super Bowl? I think just the the, the memories go with the, some of the people on the team, some guys that I really enjoy. Guys like Winston Hill, who was this giant of a tackle, as you know about him. He was a great player and a decent guy. And just some of the way 
people warmed up to me that I didn't think they would. I mean, you know, I came from Bay Ridge. You know about that. And it yes. was, you know, and immigrants were uh, a kaleidoscope in the neighborhood from Italian to Polish to Irish. And so when you got to a place where, uh, you know, especially when I got to the Steelers, um, I thought, oh, my, this is a team that's, you know, uh, more more non-white than white. And I said, wow, and the Jets were different than that. Not that I made a difference. It just was different. And I made some great friends there and some great players. Mel Blunt, he was a cornerback. We played the same position. You never know it. What a great player. And just, you know, some of Franco Harris, Dwight White, L.C. Greenwood. Um, you know, Mean Joe Green was the nicest guy on the planet. <laughs> if you didn't cross him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing on the sidelines one time, right? And Joe Green is smoking. Because somebody we we were losing to I can't I forget the team so I'm on the outside to turn the play in I'm you know, hanging around going to run down like as fast as I can and all of a sudden as I get ready to go Joe Green grabs my jersey flips me off the field and he goes down on the kickoff I said well, you crazy Joe Joe of course I didn't argue too much <laughs> uh, because he he's a nice guy but if he was angry you were in deep trouble. <laughs> And Terry Bradshaw and all, all the characters. Hanwright, was a terrific guy. And it was more that than anything else. I mean, uh, you know, the Jets, uh, I guess I was new and sort of intimidated. Um, and uh, but, but there were some terrific guys there as well. I mean, uh, yeah. Now, I remember you on TV as a, were you an announcer or a sportscaster? But I remember you on TV doing commentaries after your playing career. What, what were you doing then? I was doing, um, I worked for CBS and uh, NBC, and I was doing commentaries on NFL and college football. And um, um, also got a, uh, it was a great experience as well, because after I stopped playing, I was doing commentary and and. During the, as I said, during the NFL season, but also got to do things like you'd never get to see the Tour de France, um, the Olympics, Barcelona, Atlanta, places like that, doing sports you couldn't imagine. I mean, I, weightlifting, uh, um, just uh, and seeing some of the greatest athletes in the world, wrestling, and just incredible. So you know, I guess I got a chance to spread across a lot of different things. It was not boring, I'll tell you that. Barcelona was beautiful. I can still see it. And uh, the Olympics was something very, very special. So, uh, yes, I was football, but and I probably was identified for that, but I also spent some time on the uh, on the Olympics doing things like, and things like the Tour de France, and things like, uh, you know, just other sports as well, offbeat sports. How how many years did you say in the broadcasting? I was in broadcasting about six, seven years. What was your next step? My next step was uh, I went out. Oh, I, I was I got involved in business and uh, went from from the broadcast booth. I continued doing some, and while I was doing that, I got into a business uh, services business, um, doing back office services for big companies, um, things like mail operations and trucking and things like that. Well, let me ask you something. I mean, you had an Ivy League education, but a lot of the guys, your contemporaries or whatever, did they do as, how many football players, retired football players, or players who cut, which happens most of the time, how many of them do well in their post-careers as opposed to how many don't do that well? I think back when, Mike, it was a lot more because the dollars weren't there to, to support you for retirement and the rest of your life. So I think it was something that uh, as the numbers went up and as guys got, I think, a little more intelligent to put things away and they got financial advisors, I think they had a better shot. Uh, today, if, if a guy signs a three- or four-year contract as a relatively high draft choice or, or a good player, he's going to make enough money to to support him the rest of his days. So um, it's a little tougher back then. You had to do a little more juggling. But uh, – yeah, you do the best you can, and uh, certainly was something that um, was mountains of enjoyment, even though the pressure was enormous. You're kidding. Stand out at – well, you were a football player. What was your position? No, I wasn't a football player, not – Oh, baseball. Yeah, but 
Um, because I, I was just about to say, um, if you've ever stood out at the cornerback position looking down at, at some of the players that played out there, one in particular you probably don't remember, Jerry Levias. The guy was as quick as anything I've seen on the planet. And trying to cover him was something else. And then you get some of the other receivers, great receivers, and uh, they say, okay, cover this guy one-on-one. Okay, sure. <laughs> Send the fire engines. <laughs> Now, one year you had five interceptions. I remember that. I was looking it over it. So what was your most memorable yeah. interception? You know, I got one against, uh, who was it, Vikings, I think. And uh, I ran it all the way back, like uh, 50 yards. And I could see the end zone. And uh, I said, this is going to be nice. I'm going to have a touchdown, a pick six, great stuff. Only someone else had an idea. I didn't see him. He smashed me out of bounds at the two-yard line. Oh, <laughs> so that was- I know. I said, come on. Yeah, the five, five interceptions, yeah, it was tied for the lead with the, in the team. So there were some good moments. There were some moments I could forget, <laughs> and I will forget. Well, listen, anybody who's been coached by Wee Viewbank and Ted Williams, that's, you got a lot of history in there, and Chuck Noll. Yeah, and Chuck Noll. Yeah. So there were yeah, different ways of coaching and winning. You know, it's interesting. You can do it multiple ways, and, and those guys were so different from one another, uh, and yet they won. Well, Super Bowl champion, John Dockery, thank you for being on Connor's Corner. Thank you, Michael. Take care now.